Today's sponsor of the SHI podcast is Carter Young. For those of you who may not know about Carter Young, which I can only assume you are brand new to student housing or you've been living under a dorm for the past 20 years, Carter Young is a debt recovery firm based in Georgia who has been specializing in debt recovery related to college students for over two decades. They even operate their call center out of Athens, Georgia, because they wanted to employ people who understand the student journey in order to give them a better chance of collecting from your student residents who end up owing you a balance after they move out. They also provide training programs to your on-site staff and review your operating methods to make sure everything is being done to prevent bad debt from happening. Now, how many debt recovery services do that? If you're not using Carter Young, I can guarantee you're leaving money on the table. Visit them at carter-young.com or follow the link in the show notes. Welcome to the Student Housing Insight Podcast, where we are putting you in touch with the people who bring student housing to life. And I honestly don't think that has ever been more true than today, because joining me today are three of our Student Housing Insight Ambassadors. We've got Aaron Shea. Hello. Aaron, how are you? Good. How are you? Doing well. I'm doing well. She's the Community Manager for Cardinal, Cardinal Group Management in San Bernardino, California. How are things in California today? West Coast. Um, They are sunny and beautiful. It was raining earlier this morning, but super pretty. Um, Yeah, California, living the California dream over here. Well, great. And also joining us is Randy Paulson, who's the director of student housing at Young America Realty, where he's somewhere a little bit colder today in normal (laughs) Illinois. How are things going, Randy? It, it's going well, Wes. I got my blanket ready to go and a balmy 10 degrees here in normal. Fantastic. And then last but certainly not least, we've got Maria Philippone, who is the Senior Director of Marketing at Peak Made Real Estate, which is formerly known as Peak Campus. And she's joining us from sunny Orlando, Florida. How are you doing today, Maria? I'm doing great. And sunny Orlando, indeed. Probably the, one of the only places where it's sitting in the 80s right now. <laughs> Well, it's uh, I'm in I'm in kind of the upstate of South Carolina today, where it's cold and rainy. Hence the reason my voice sounds the way that it does, because I feel like it has rained every single day, and it just plays with my allergies. So I hope the audience will forgive us for that. But um, hey, I, I want to you know make sure that that we share a little bit with our audience about you guys. Um, We'll start with with Aaron. Two things I want everybody to know, Aaron. How many years have you been in student housing and what does the day-to-day of your current position look like? Yeah, so I've been in student housing for three years. Um, Day-to-day really on site is never the same, especially with COVID and other things, but really it's as a community manager, just providing support wherever I can, whether that's leasing, employee support, dealing with residents, however that may be, kind of just being where the team needs me, but also being, you know, the leader and kind of driving the ship in the right direction. Awesome. Randy, how about you? You you know, your company's a little bit different from from Maria and Aaron's. You guys don't have a huge national footprint. Um, So, you know, you, you probably ought to tell us a little bit about about Young America sure. um, as well as as well as yourself. Sure. So, uh, yeah, my name is Randy Paulson. Uh, I'm in my 16th season in student housing. So we're going to call them season and not years. OK. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so I've been around the industry for a long time now. Uh, I started off as a leasing agent and just kind of worked my way through the ranks of the leasing world and the operation world. Um, as director of student housing for Young America, I oversee the sales, marketing, and owner relationships uh, of 5,000 purpose-built student housing beds here in the middle of Illinois. Well, awesome. And Maria, let's go to you. Um, I've been working specifically in student housing for about six years now, um, all in, in the multifamily industry for going on 17. So it's been quite a long journey for me as well. My day-to-day uh, in the life uh, is running and supporting a great team of people who help manage not just our property brands, but also our corporate brand. 
um, and just really supporting and uplifting our sales teams um, and making sure they have all the tools and resources that them and the site teams need for all things marketing and sales related. Awesome. So guys, we've got really just an incredible interview to share with the podcast audience today, but you guys have already heard it because you all attended the first session of our weekly webinar that we're calling Memo. It airs on Wednesdays at 12 noon. If you're in our audience and you'd like to be a part of it, if you're not already registered, go to studenthousinginsight.com and you can click on the link right there in the middle of the page and go through the registration process. This web series is basically a weekly meetup of student housing professionals where each week we are diving into specific topics with interviews and panel discussions. We're using a platform that allows us to to chat and video chat with other attendees if you if you want to video chat with other attendees. We've also got a virtual exhibit hall where you can talk with our sponsors about their products and services. It's a lot of fun. Would you guys agree? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Love it. Yeah, I've, we've done two so far and getting ready for the for the third coming up this week. And it's been it's been a lot of fun. But anyway, our, our first session of Memo was with the best selling author and award winning entrepreneur, Kristen Hadid. If you've never heard of Kristen, just Google her sometime. You'll you'll find a lot about her. She's got some great TEDx videos that she's done over her career as well. But she's the author of Permission to Screw Up, which tells her story on how she was wanting to earn 99 bucks for a pair of blue jeans. That ended up turning into a, into a cleaning company employing almost 500 students. What I love about her book and why it is so relevant to, to student housing is because the first chapter literally starts in a clubhouse at a student housing property in Gainesville, Florida during summer turn. If you're a real student housing professional, you know that turn exposes everything. If you've not appropriately prepared, regardless if you work on site or as a vendor, you will fail. And, or as Kristen puts it, you'll screw up. But, you know, giving yourself and your team permission to screw up uh, so you can learn from it is really the difference between letting failure define you and allowing failure to refine you. So let's cut to the interview. And when we come back, we'll talk to this crew here about what they took away from this interview. Guys, thanks so much for joining in today um, and being a part of this of this first memo series. Jennifer, I, I'm going to talk with you first. You're serving as my special co-host today, uh, and I appreciate you doing that so much, as well as as Cardinal being a sponsor of our, of our memo series and and playing a huge part in this keynote that we're about to hear today from Kristen Hadid. But man, 2020 has been crazy. Um, you've been you've been uh, in the thick of it, and you know, just really wanted to to kind of bring you in, get get some feedback from from you on some of that stuff. But just really quick for our audience who you know they don't know Jennifer Cassidy, give us a little bit of a background. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me today, Wes. I'm going to contain my enthusiasm um, for our speaker today. But um, as you mentioned, I am with Cardinal. I serve as uh, SVP of operations. And at Cardinal, we really put a strong emphasis on our core values. And one of those is to pursue growth and knowledge. So we're really thrilled to have the opportunity today to sponsor this event and to partner with you and Student Housing Insights to just continue to provide opportunities for leaders in this space to grow and develop in their roles. Um, this is a, a passionate area for me. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I started my journey in student housing as a community assistant. Um, I was going to school at the University of South Florida, I was studying to be pre-med like uh, so many people in this industry was not pursuing a career in student housing, but needed a, a job to get through college. Um, and after a few years of holding um, some different roles on site, I just really developed a love for the industry and the people in it. And I think, you know, the biggest thing that 
uh, for me made me decide to pick this industry for a career was just the ability to impact people at such a critical juncture in their life, whether it be, you know, the first place that they live away from home or the first place that they work um, in a professional career. And um, I think that's what, you know, still keeps me here today. Um, my favorite role, I think, of all the roles I've held, and I, I've pretty much done them all, um, is the role of community manager. And I love that, yes. you know, in the role <laughs> that I I serve in today, I still get to interact with a lot of our community managers. But it's just such a, a great opportunity to build relationships with residents and with staff but also to continue to learn how to operate real estate. And so you get kind of the best of both worlds. And, you know, thank, thankfully to the positive side of social media, I still keep in contact with so many of my residents and my team from the first property that I managed. It's, um, so, much, it's so much fun seeing their growth, isn't it? It is. And so um, I'm just really, really grateful for the time that I spent on site and the lessons that I learned. And so many of those lessons, I feel, um, as a community manager, translate to your leadership as you grow and as you supervise different teams and different size teams. Um, So, you know, speaking to our community managers out there today, there's just there's so many great lessons you're learning in your role. So I've just got to ask. What was your biggest screw up? You know, that's hard to answer because there's been quite a few. Um, (laughs) I would say for me, the biggest lesson learned, because I do try to look at mistakes as opportunities, um, was in the the handling of a performance issue early in my uh, multi-site career, I had to let a team member go. And I think that, um, you know, I thought I had done a good job in coaching, but after the fact and after getting some feedback from the team member, I don't think I did enough. But the benefit of that situation is it's always stuck with me. um, And it's made me a huge proponent of just open and honest feedback and giving people the opportunity to improve. So I do think that some of those kind of big failures are also our greatest opportunities to do better. Well, it's, it's perfect to reflect on that because we've got somebody who knows all about screw ups. She actually wrote a book about it called permission to screw up. And and I got to tell you, there's some pretty crazy comments here on the back. Seth Godin is one. Um, I believe uh, Simon Sinek was also mentioned here. And uh, so our guest today is, is definitely someone who, who certainly understands how to, how to learn from screw ups. So I'm excited to, to talk to her. But not only does she know how to learn from screw ups, she is dealing with college students all the time because that's what she does at her company, Student Made. So with that being said, I'm going to, Ask Kristen Hadid to come on up. Hi. <laughs> Kristen, no, thanks so much. I, I've been so excited about, about being able to do this. You're just coming back from a, a three-week mini sabbatical over the holidays. And, you know, I know this, this was not easy to put on your calendar. Uh, <laughs> but thanks so much for, for spending time with us today. So happy to be here. And after three weeks off, I'm like ready. <laughs> Fresh and ready. <laughs> So now you, you were in Gainesville. Student Made is located in Gainesville. You're now in Houston, Texas. Is that right? Yep. Great. So give us a little bit of, of a background. You know, our audience members that, that may not be familiar with, with you or, or your book, you're really about reframing failure as you know, obviously it, the, the book kind of <laughs> does that perfectly just in, the, in its title. But for those that, that don't know, I mean, this a lot of this really came out of the uh, failure you had at, at Summer Turn in Gainesville. And, and that's when when I first heard your story, I believe it was on the uh, Entree Leadership podcast. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you started saying, I started this this cleaning company in Gainesville and I got this big contract and I was like, oh, <laughs> she knows about summer turn. <laughs> and it just immediately everything that that I've you know seen you do as far as your TEDx talks and everything else, I, I just tune in and it's it's it really 
I, I'm excited for our for our, our audience today on what they're going to be able to take away from this. But for those that don't know, will you give us our background and tell us how it all started with a pair of blue jeans at the mall? <laughs> yes. So the story begins in 2007. I was 19 years old. I was studying at the University of Florida and just not really sure what I wanted to do with my life. And kind of was all over the place. I'd changed my major, I think, eventually nine times, was even pre-med <laughs> at one point. Um, and I ended up choosing finance. And the reason was because all my friends were studying finance. They had a plan to move to New York. They wanted to work on Wall Street. And even though I wasn't really excited about that future path, I just was so lost and, and not really sure what else to do that I decided I'll just do what my friends are doing. And so that's really what I thought my life was going to look like moving to New York and being an investment banker. And one day my friends invited me to go to the mall and I had no money. And my plan was to just window shop. And as we were walking through the mall, I fell in love with a pair of jeans that today I would never wear. They're hideous. Like if you remember the <laughs> jeans that have the jewels going all down the side and, you know, these were jeweled out and I just loved them. And I remember they were $99 and I thought, what can I do to buy these? And so I had a scholarship, but I didn't have any extra money for anything else. And I was always entrepreneurial as a kid, even though I never saw myself as an entrepreneur or even that that was an option for me. I just was always into little businesses as a child. I mean, I had a lemonade stand. I had a babysitting service, all kinds of stuff. So I think it was just that childlike entrepreneur in me that thought, what's something I can do on my own really quickly to make the money for these jeans? And the first idea that I had was to put an ad on Craigslist to clean someone's house. And it's not like I liked cleaning. I didn't have a lot of experience. I mean, cleaning my own room and, and that was really it. So of course, the woman who hires me has a 4,000 square foot house and I have no clue what I'm doing and it went horribly, but she paid me and I bought the jeans and I thought that that was it. And then she ended up calling me the next day. And it's so funny because she said, I really need help and I'll teach you how to clean. You know, what do you say about continuing to clean my house? But the funny part is she had to teach me. She had to teach me how to clean. So thank goodness for her because that this is really where it all began. And I began cleaning her home every week. And then she told her friends about me. And next thing I know, seven days a week, I'm cleaning houses. And the turning point happened right before my last year. I was 21. And I got a contract to clean a few properties during turn. And you'll, for those of you listening, I mean, you'll, you'll crack up. I mean, I had no team. Okay. So I signed a contract to clean 800 apartments. I had no team and I had obviously never done turn before. And so I had no idea what to expect. And I put an ad on Craigslist to hire people. And at the time I thought that it would be great to work with students. I knew how hard it was to find a job as a student and so I hired 60 people, all students. I didn't do any training. I remember we were sitting in my living room, crammed in my living room. And I asked, does everyone know how to clean? You know, raise your hand if you don't know how to clean and no one raised their hand. So I'm thinking, oh, I just got so lucky. How, you know, the odds, I found 60 people who all know how to clean. And of course, I soon learned that most of them did not know how to clean. And there was this really, really defining moment three days in, to turn. And I was sitting in a clubhouse eating lunch, um, not really sure what I was supposed to be doing while my 60 team members were cleaning these apartments. And all of a sudden I look out the window and I see a herd of people in the parking lot walking towards the, the clubhouse of this apartment complex. And um, I realized those are, those are my, that's my team, you know, and I'm thinking something must be wrong. They're coming in here because they need help with something. And so they come in and they're whispering and, you know, you just get that feeling in your gut that something, something's not right. And I got that feeling. And then next thing I know, someone stands forward in front of the whole group and she says, we quit. And uh, there were 45 of them. And this is how my book opens. 45 people just walked out. So I lost 75% of my team in a matter of five minutes. And that was the most defining moment of I my just, life. I just have to clarify yeah, something. Please. Because 
Jennifer's done a lot of properties and she's managed a lot of properties in Gainesville. I just got to know, is, has this come full circle? Was it, was this one of Jennifer's properties by chance? <laughs> So it wasn't my property, but ironically, I, I as a regional had worked with Kristen and her team at a property in Gainesville. So true to the student housing industry, everything comes full circle. But thankfully, the 45 <laughs> people did not walk off my property. Oh, my goodness. I mean, it was just, you know, and to, I was 21. So it's like I, I wasn't really self-aware. Uh, I didn't have any leadership experience. So it what was really frustrating about it is I didn't even know what my role was. Now, when I look back, I, I was a horrible leader. I mean, I didn't know anyone's names. I didn't know how to, you know, make a team feel like a team. But at that point, I didn't have that awareness. So as you'll probably learn about me, um, my background and growing up, my parents really encouraged failure. They talked about it. At dinner, we talked about what didn't go well today. My parents modeled that failure was okay, that you could talk about it, that you could learn from it. And every time we failed, it was what was the learning lesson? What was the gift that you could learn from this and carry forward in your life? So I just responded to the situation exactly like I had learned to do my whole life, which is when you fail, you have to take ownership of it. You have to talk about it and you have to identify the learning in it. So I went to the 15 people who had not quit and you have to, I mean, these, these weren't exactly my top people because they didn't even know that 45 had walked out. I mean, they were just kind of like totally, you know, like, did you not notice that 75% of the team is no longer here? And um, I'm like, we, we got to come up with a plan. What should we do? And we had this emergency meeting and we promised everyone an early paycheck if they showed up. And I had no clue what to say. Of course, they all show up. And I remember just being honest and, and saying, I have no clue what I'm doing. I know I messed up. I'm not really sure what I did, though. I need you to teach me. I want to know. I want to be better. And they all came back. And that experience did a couple of things for me. One, it taught me the power of being human and just when you screw up, just talking about it and that yeah. people want to help you. You know, they, they see you as a yeah. human being, but more so that was really what inspired my curiosity around leadership and culture. And it's what made me turn down a finance job. And now here we are in May, it will be 14 years. That is incredible. Absolutely incredible. Well, you know, thanks so much for, for sharing that, for writing the book. It's been a huge inspiration and, you know, excited to jump into this. Jennifer, I think you've got our first question. Yeah. And kudos to you, Kristen, for that entrepreneurial spirit. I can't imagine that feeling when you realized I may have lost three quarters of my team and I still have 800 bedrooms to clean. Um, I feel like there's just a ton of parallels between what you and your team at Student Maid do and for our viewers in that in our industry, we hire a lot of part-time students and they are our front line and they're communicating with our residents and our prospects and parents. And as you know, this is a kind of a high turnover age group. You, like most of our student housing managers, are a millennial and you're working with largely Gen Z. Um, so how could you describe your approach to leadership and just overcoming the challenge of really needing to connect with this generation and get buy-in? Great, great questions. And I think the first thing is sometimes I have to remind myself over and over and our leadership team is this in the same boat. This is their first job, you know, and this is their first experience most of the time, you know. And in they're first, cleaning toilets they're on cleaning, top of that. You know, they're cleaning. And so it's so easy to become frustrated and things that you think should be obvious. It's like, why aren't you doing it that way? But it's having the empathy that this is their first job. And when we look at, I don't like to stereotype, right? And say that all Gen Z's like this and millennials are like this. I do think though, that millennials and Gen Z have been brought up in, an, in a, in a time when technology has kind of robbed us of our independent thinking, because when we have a question, we can just Google it. Or when we need directions, we can just ask our phone and it tells us step by step where to go or even younger we're looking now at these apps that people are using in elementary school where they can take a picture of their homework and it's texting them the answers and so i think there's a piece of this where maybe we're noticing that 
um, you know, the problem solving isn't quite there or the confidence to solve a problem maybe isn't quite there or maybe even the inability to connect because we're so used to texting and being behind a screen instead of talking face to face with someone, um, maybe even a sense of entitlement, which I would go to say isn't really entitlement. It's that everything with this device happens instantly, you know, and in our careers and, and that kind of relationships, it requires patience. So I think a part of this is we have to teach. And I think we have to give people a reason to care. You know, why should I care to come to work every day? Why should I give it my best? And I think when we can invest in people and we can help them grow and develop and make them feel as if they're becoming a better person, a better version of themselves by being a part of our team, that's when something shifts. So it's little things. It's like giving feedback, as you said, Jennifer, when, you know, to, to help someone grow, it's teaching um, someone a different way to do something. It's empowering them. One of my favorite things to do is instead of solving something for someone, ask, well, what do you think we should do? You know, what are two options that you can think of? And if people really feel like they're growing with your, your organization, you know, I think that reduces the turnover because they associate the job with becoming a better version of themselves. Yeah, that's that's really that's really key. And for the managers that are listening out there, um, that doesn't necessarily work up one when you ask the question, well, what do you think we should do? <laughs> but it definitely does down one. I'll never forget. I had someone ask me that and they said, well, that's what you ask. And I'm like, <laughs> well, feedback from you. That's why <laughs> that's that's great. And yeah, that uh, technology does play so much into that. And mm. You know, just looking at, at what happened, I was chatting with somebody the other day that said, you know, asked the question, you know, because so many people are leaving some of these popular social media platforms to go to other social media platforms. And, and the client said, does our property need a, you know, do they need an account for these other, you know, platforms that they're jumping to? And I, wow, that, even more that we've got to keep up with, but it's certainly even when you're talking about, especially when you're talking about our customers, but but also even with with employees, we kind of meet them where they're at, and I think that's kind of the key thing there that you that you mentioned. Can so, I, I add one more thing? Yeah, there's a great book that I read at the beginning of my journey called The Dream Manager, and it's actually a story of a cleaning company. And the whole idea is that this cleaning company decides to hire a dream manager. And the dream manager's responsibility is to learn more about each part-time worker and learn more about the dreams that they have for their lives. And the dreams could be anything from, I want to save $500 to, I want to buy my first car to, I want to get an internship. And so this person's job is to help each, each individual reach their dreams, help them make a plan, hold them accountable to it. So when I read the book, we actually hired a dream manager. And it was really interesting. Um, and then what I realized is, wait a minute, I don't want this to be one person's job. I want to create a culture where we're helping one another reach for the things we really want in our lives. And so I think sometimes we overcomplicate leadership and we think we have to do these big grand things. And the fact is we're all super busy. So it could just be talking to someone over a cup of coffee, like what's a dream that you have for the next year and, yeah. you know, giving them a resource that could help them get there. And those are the kinds of things that show someone you really care about them and give them then a reason to care about showing up at work. Yeah. I love that. And I also love what you said about connecting people to the why. I think that that's so important. Um, when people can associate meaning with their work, you know, they're going to be so much more passionate about it. But you know, something that I love that Cardinal does is celebrate people's personal wins. So each month it might be who got a dog or who had a baby or who moved into a new apartment. And I think, you know, what you said about a dream manager, it's, you know, watching people's personal growth and success as a result of the company's growth and success is what it's all about. You know, I think when you can celebrate that people are growing in their lives, it makes it, you know, more motivating to want to do the hard work to see people around you continue to be able to achieve that. Yeah, totally. So I feel like that's a pretty good transition into, you know, kind of the next thing I want to talk to you about, which is, is, you know, goal setting. 
coming out of the end of 2020, I, I think there was a, a bit of PTSD that I was dealing with because I'm, I'm a big goal person and I love spending that, you know, end of December, first of January time frame, you know, really kind of laying out what's happening, you know, personally for, for myself, my family, the company. And it's, I, I'll be honest, I'm still struggling with it. And, <laughs> and it, I think a lot of it's just because, just because the, you know, the goalpost moved so much in 2020 with, with COVID and, and all the things that, that unraveled in 2020. And, you know, I'm just wondering, I mean, are, are you dealing with the same thing? Is your company dealing with the same thing? How are you guys approaching that? So I think this season is causing us to have to redefine success and to figure out how can we put our energy into the things that we can control and how can we differentiate between what's in our control and what's outside of our control. And I I kind of feel like I've learned that planning is guessing, you know, we can do our very best to make a plan. Who could have anticipated that 2020 was going to pan out the way that it did. And sometimes we have to shift and this is where resilience comes in. And so there are two words that guide me and that really, and and for each of us, these words may be different, right? So it's kind of like, what's the vision that you have for yourself? What, how do you want people to describe you as a leader, as a human, as a person? And for me, it's courage and compassion, no matter what I'm doing, I want to lead with courage and compassion. And if at the end of the day, I can say that I did that, it's a successful day. And so I think that's the kind of thing that's certain. We can control how we show up. We can control the impact we have on others. The plans may have to shift and change, but the way that we show up as humans is always 100% in our control. So just really encouraging my team to think about that. Like, what is the story that you're writing as a leader? How do you want to be remembered during this time and focus your energy there? As a company, we had a huge goal to pay off our debt this year. We have been paying off business loans that were supposed to expire in 2025. And at the beginning of 2020, we had a goal to pay off the rest of them in 2025 years early. We were all set, ready to do it. Everything was on track. And then the pandemic. And it was so defeating. Um, to be in that final stretch and then to think that that wasn't a possibility anymore. And we actually just kind of gave ourselves permission to walk away from that goal and instead just really focus on who do we want to be in this time. We ended up reaching the goal. And, you know, I'm not saying that that's the case all the time for everyone, but I think that when you can put your focus into yourself and your values and how you're showing up, you will achieve things that maybe you thought were impossible because that's the stuff that really matters. Yeah, Yeah, that's remarkable. And, and I attended one of your Wednesday webinars and I know you and your team talked a lot about the 12 week year. And for me, um, it was so impactful to start to think about goals in a different way. I think Wes, like you said, we all kind of look at a year and in 2020, you know, we couldn't get through a day without something changing. So hearing your approach to like taking goals and breaking them down into smaller, you know, bite-sized pieces, I think is really helpful just to give people our perspective on how to accomplish something and be able to move forward. Yeah. And that comes from a book, the 12 week year and just high level. It's really cool. It's, it's like, instead of thinking about your goals on an annual basis, think about what, what can I, focus on for the next 12 weeks, because we can see the next 12 weeks a lot clearer than we can see a year down the road or five years down the road. And so as a team, we've really tried to embrace that. And just really, it's a quarterly basis. What's our goal for this quarter? What are we going to put our energy into this quarter? What's within our control this quarter? And sort of treating each quarter like its own year. And that it's been really cool and really freeing because it's a lot of pressure I think to think about the whole year and the plan for the whole year when as 2020 taught us so much can change. Yeah. 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 Specific to our industry. I feel like so much of student housing is kind of contingent upon what's happening with the university. And, and that was so unpredictable for 2020. And, you know, I think we all remain optimistic that there will be a little bit more predictability in 2021, but I know for 
many of our teams uh, setting goals in the way they used to is tough because they don't have certainty around what they can expect. So I really like what you said about choosing who you want to be um, and, you know, maybe hanging on to one of those leadership attributes that you possess as a person that you think you can be better at or looking at an area where you've wanted to grow and really taking the opportunity to better leverage a weakness as a strength in the new year. Because I think you're right. It's harder to kind of come up with those finite goals, but we can always find things that we want to be better at. Yeah. And I, I know we're we're going to take some questions from from the chat. I I think that one thing that is connected to this is resilience. And it's how in a time when it is so uncertain and we're faced with change and challenges, do we become resilient in the moment? And it's hard. It's like, how do you make resilience appear out of nowhere, you know, if you're not feeling resilient? And I think one of the ways we can do that is by looking at the past and thinking about what are the things that we've been through, whether you do this individually, just as your own reflection or with your team, what are the times in my life or as a team that we have felt really challenged and we have felt really uncertain or it has felt impossible or we are faced with a really daunting obstacle and make a list of those things. And then next to each one, what did you get from it? What did you learn from it? What was the gift that you got from it? Which is really what my parents taught me growing up. Like that's how we can frame challenges. There's a gift if we choose to look for it. And whenever I'm having a rough day, I just look at, I call it a resilience resume. I look back at all the things that I've been through, like the 45 people walking out on me. And I realize that, yeah, I may not have another pandemic on my resilience resume, but I have (laughs) had hard times. And I've had times where I had similar feelings. And look, not only did I survive, I learned something. I became better. I grew. And to do this as a team is really powerful because as a team, you realize, wait, we've done some really hard things. And it gives you hope that what you're learning and what you're going through right now, it does, it, it's, it's hard right now, but one day you'll be looking back on this time and you'll be saying, look at all the, the stuff that we learned. Look, look how it made us better. And it'll be giving you resilience for whatever obstacle you're facing in the future. So I do want to move over to the, to the Q and A, and we've got um, we've got a couple that are coming in now, and I would just encourage everybody else. Um, hey, this is this is a great opportunity to um, uh, to talk to a really a, a millennial who has figured it out. <laughs> well, I, don't know about that. I, I I feel that way. Um, I, I've I've been following you for a while, and it's. It's amazing how many little nuggets um, Jennifer and I were talking about this um, in the in the green room before um, that uh, we've just it's amazing. Some of the things that you've said, how they've just kind of stuck with us over time. And um, and, and before I get to the Q&A, that was actually um, one thing I wanted to to make sure that um, we gave you a, an opportunity to talk about. But you've got a subscription email list and, and a lot of things that I know Jennifer mentioned it at the beginning. Um, can you tell us a little bit, tell the audience members a little bit more on how they can follow you? Yeah. So I have a blog and every Tuesday I write something about leadership, you know, whatever is on my heart. And if you subscribe, you'll get that to your inbox every Tuesday. I promise to never, ever spam you. And it's just my website, kristenhadid.com and you click on blog and you sub- you can subscribe um, on every social media platform except for TikTok. I don't know if I'll ever be on TikTok, but you can follow me everywhere else with, with my name, Kristen Hadid. My most favorite thing is our Wednesday live. And this is every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And what I love about it is that I'm on with my leadership team. And we talk about the challenges that we've had as leaders over the, over the last week. And What's cool is that you get to hear from different points of view and different perspectives. And we take questions from the audience and it's one hour every Wednesday. We record it. So if you miss it, it's always on my Facebook page right after, but would love to see you there. Yeah, that, that would be, that would be awesome. So I've got a couple of questions coming in. Let's uh, I'll, I'll read off this first one. Uh, it's coming from an anonymous attendee. As a leader who might be feeling unmotivated or drained, how do you find your passion again and continue to be a positive light for the rest of your team that is looking up to you? That's, 
I deal with that with my kids <laughs> and it's so tough. So yeah. Uh, what's your, what's been your experience with yeah. trying to get over those, those slumps? So I think we have to talk about empathy and there's two angles to empathy. It's empathy for others and empathy for ourselves. And 2020 for me has been a lesson in empathy because what I've learned is that empathy isn't about fixing things. It's not about solving things. It's not about, um, have you tried this and maybe you should try that. It's about acknowledging how someone feels and validating how they feel. And so it was like, from a leader's perspective, when you're hearing your team saying things like, I'm afraid. And what if a loved one of mine gets sick? And what if, you know, it's, it's like, there's really nothing we can say to change what's happening in the world and to make that go away. And it was almost a feeling of putting your hands up in the air as a leader and realizing there's nothing I can do to change this. So the only option was to acknowledge. It's like, I totally understand why you feel that way. And I'm so sorry that that is weighing on you. And what I learned is it's our job to create a supportive, loving, caring environment, but it's not our job to solve everything and fix everything. And so something that came out of it for us was called team time. And we still have this to this day, every other week with the people you work closest with, it's an empathy meeting. It's just, how's everyone doing? How's everyone feeling? There's no solutions. There's no, it's just each person shares and then you're acknowledged for how you feel. And so it's really important that when we as leaders are having moments where we feel unmotivated and we don't feel maybe positive, that we don't put the pressure on ourselves to pretend to be someone we're not. It's totally okay to say to your team, I'm having an off day. And that's what empathy looks like when we're giving empathy towards ourselves, it's not like, oh, you need to snap out of this. And, oh, you need to be productive. And I've had so many days where I just cannot do it. I'm looking at my to-do list and I'm looking at the computer and I'm like, I don't know what's happening, but words are hard today, you know? And, yeah. and it's, let's give ourselves permission to be human and to acknowledge that because if we put on a front and, and we pretend like we always have it together, what that actually does is it puts pressure on other people to operate at that same level. And that's not human. Yeah. So I would just encourage you the next time you have that, give yourself grace, allow yourself to feel that do something that brings you energy, whether it's reading a book, going for a walk, give yourself permission to walk away and then tell that story to your team and see what that does. Yeah. And I, you know, to, to help answer or, or give some insight to this, to the person that asked this question, I think one other thing, at least what's worked for me, I think is, is getting to know yourself. And, uh, you know, it's, it's so important to do, you know, a lot of these self-assessment type things, uh, understanding, you know, who you are, you know, what your love languages are. I know, um, Kristen, you're, you're big into that. I think it's uh words of affirmation. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, I think, I think knowing those things and, you know, by knowing those things, you can kind of learn how to recharge yourself in a lot of ways, but yeah, giving yourself grace is, is huge. So yeah, thanks to that. So we've got another question here. How do you find the balance of being a leader and holding people accountable while remaining relatable, personable to your team? Often question if I'm tiptoeing on a fine line, I completely get that. Yeah. Kristen, any uh, any insight? You know, giving feedback and holding people accountable was probably the toughest thing for me to learn. And even today is still hard. And it's, I think that leadership is holding people accountable and giving people feedback. And I think that if we don't do that, we actually lose trust because we know that there's got to be a way we can be better. And so if our leader is never, ever giving us that feedback or holding us accountable, when we screw up. It's kind of like, well, what else aren't they telling us? You know, we, we sort of maybe don't trust that they're giving us the whole story of, of how they feel. And I always respect when someone is honest with me and calls me out, you know, it, it makes me trust that person. Like I know where I stand. I know that if something's off, they're going to say it. So I think it's Brene Brown who says clear is kind and just thinking about when someone has dropped the ball or um, you notice a way for them to grow, that it takes courage and it takes courage to, to get uncomfortable. But if we really want to be leaders and we really want to help people be the best that we can be, it requires getting uncomfortable. 
in my book, I have a tool that I teach called the FBI. And this comes from Bob Chapman, who is a leader (laughs) I love and admire so much. And the FBI is a method to give feedback that is clear and compassionate and also direct. And, and, you know, you know what you're, you're not sugarcoating and fluffing it. You're saying it how it is. So it goes like this. The F is feeling, the B is behavior, and the I is impact. How do you feel? What was the behavior that made you feel that way? And what's the impact of the behavior? So let's just say you have a team member who is late for a shift, you know, or, or they're late to work. This is what an FBI could look like. I feel disappointed that you're 30 minutes late to work today. And the impact is now I'm not sure if I can rely on you. Can you please help me understand what happened? And I've just learned that when you can lean into that, people, you build trust because people know that you're going to share when there's something here instead of hiding it. And inevitably it's going to come out in a review or somewhere down the road. And then when that person learns that you've been holding on to that, now all of a sudden they don't trust you when you say everything's okay. Cause in the past you've said that and it turns out it wasn't. Yeah, Love that. And you know, it's so relevant to the example I shared early yeah. on in terms of like not providing that feedback and then getting to the worst case scenario where you have to separate and you have somebody looking at you saying, you didn't tell me this before. And so I think, you know, we always have to remember if I was the other person, would I want to know this feedback about myself? And I love the concept that you outlined. And I've also read Kim Scott's Radical Candor. And I love the concepts of uh, caring personally and challenging directly. I think, you know, when you read that book and you read about uh, insincerity or ruinous empathy, we've all been guilty of it at some point. But when you can give the feedback and show somebody, I'm challenging this, but I care about you. Uh, that investment and that trust that you build, they take responsibility for the outcome and they want to do better. Yeah. And I think how you set up the conversation is probably the most important thing. It, I think that's where a lot of people get stuck is how do I just start it? Once I start it, I'm good, but how do I start it? And I just like to say, it's exactly what you, I have something really difficult to share with you. And I'm going to share it because I care about you, you know, and that's the truth. It's like, I don't want to share this with you, but I care, which is why I'm going to. Awesome. I've got, so there, there's another question. I was going to move to another one. Now we've got quite a few that are coming in, yeah. but one that's kind of on that same, you know, as we're dealing with this uh, new reality that we're in, I think this is kind of goes back to what you talked about. I talked about a little bit earlier, but with a little bit of a twist during this new environment of everyone working remote, what are some tactics? Oh, this is actually from one of our ambassadors, Maria. Sorry. Anyway, during this new envi- environment of everyone working remote, what are some tactics you would recommend to continue to motivate your team and stay engaged as a team? And I think this is huge because uh, for you, because you're in Houston, your team is back in Gainesville. I think you've got some other leadership members who are remote. And I can imagine doing, a, you know, running a, a cleaning company and uh, during this you know, during a pandemic and also being remote. I mean, that's, that's had to be just heck on you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, first, hi, Maria. Amazing question. And I think there's a couple of things. So when we are in this kind of context meeting this way, it's even more important that we're intentional about how we show up. So we have a a general rule of thumb that when we meet virtually, everyone's screen has got to be on. Because when we look at communication, 90% of it is the nonverbal cues, the body language, eye contact, tone of voice. So when we have our screens off, we're missing all of that. And there's no way that we can really connect on a human level. And it would be like in a, if you were in a meeting, taking your notebook and doing this, you know, we would never do that in a meeting. So having the screen off is, is I think, huge. Or having it on is really important. Another thing is, how do you build connection and trust in meetings? And you could start with something called a personal check-in, which could just be, how are you doing today? How's everyone doing? Take a moment to share. If you're in a big group, you could put people in breakout rooms to do that. It just shows that you care about people on a personal level. And then, okay, now let's talk about the business that we're here to discuss. Kind of like that team time thing, you know, that I was, I was saying, it doesn't have to be a long 
period of time. It's just something to show people that you care about them personally. And I think that we've got to um, encourage our people to do things that bring them energy. And what's hard about being in a work from home situation is there's no boundaries. It's there's no line. Our living room is our office. No. So it's okay to say after 6 p.m. I'm not answering emails. It's okay to take a break in the middle of the day and go for a walk. And as a leader, you have to model that. So the more that you can do that and talk about that, the more you give permission for your people to do the same because burnout is real. And if we hit burnout, we're not good for ourselves, our families, or the people we work with. Yeah. Hey, I've got a, I've got a question just to kind of build off that. Cause I had a similar discussion with one of my clients today who's, you know, starting his own company and, you know, he, he's, he's my age. Um, we're not, we're not millennials, but pretty close to it. So, <laughs> but you know, he, he just said, I, I, I believe in, in the office and, and, you know, I told him, I said, your core team and where you're at now and trying to figure things out, that's, that is really important. And I just wonder, do you think you could have started, you know, what you did with student, could you have started student made remote or do you feel like being in an office and being around that core team was necessary, at least in that season? Gee, I mean, I can't imagine starting a brand new business with a brand new team this way. And at the same time, when I think about our team now, there are many people that I have not met ever. And this is the mm -hmm. only way I've met them. And we, yet we've been able to build trust and connection and be a team. And I think that it requires a lot more intentionality when you're doing it this way. I think it's absolutely possible. I think it requires a lot more intentionality and yeah. getting to know people one-on-one -on -one and having, you know, one-on-one -on -one Zoom coffees to, to get to know people. Um, but, you know, I do think that there's now that we've shown that working from home can happen, I do think there are going to be some shifts. I think that there are going to be people who expect that that's a possibility. I think that, um, you know, for some, it's attractive in a job to be able to have that for some, they've learned this isn't for me and I don't want a job where I work from home. So I just I think there are some shifts. And I think the more we can adapt um, to those, you know, the better we are set up for for success for the future. Yeah. All right. We've got two more questions. You still got some time? Oh, yeah, I'm good. All right. So what is your morning routine and how do you start your day to be better and intentional? Yeah. So my morning routine is about centering myself and it's about doing the things for me that I need to do to feel complete and whole so that I can then give to others. I used to save all that for the end of the day, like working out and reading a book. And what happens inevitably, you get to the end of the day and you say, I'll do it tomorrow because <laughs> you're tired. Yep. So um, I work out in the morning. I read in the morning. I look at who I'm meeting with. And I just, I have a notebook where I write down my goals and my intentions and how I want to show up. And, you know, I would say in general, it's three hours, which means I have to get up early, which means I have to go to bed early. But for me, that's really important because I know if I start my day that way, I'm going to be the person I want to be. If I don't do that, I can feel a difference. And if I don't do that for too long, then I begin to resent my work because I see it as it's taking me away from the person that I want to be and the things I want to do for myself. So I just, I don't think it's selfish to put ourselves first. I think we have to, in order to be able to really be able to support and help others. So what is that? Maybe your time for yourself is in the evening, protect that time, put it on your calendar. Um, guard it, you know, and maybe it has to be really early if that's the only time that you can count on, but it's worth it because you've got to, it's the whole, you can't, what is it? The oxygen thing. It's like put your own oxygen on, right? Yeah. Before you put, help your neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree with that more. I I'm a morning person too. And I always tell myself when that alarm goes off at five 30, if you can just get one foot on the floor, you can do it. But something I did want to add to what you said is just, finding something every day to be grateful for and starting your day with that energy. I think if there's anything that I took from 2020, it was to learn to appreciate just the little things or the little moments. And if you can start your day, just being grateful for the fact that the weather's going to be beautiful or that it's going to be sunny and there's no rain or that you can go for a walk. I mean, just really finding the ability to 
be grateful and just savor everyday moments. If there's anything that I took away from a very difficult year, it was that the great parts of life aren't the big moments. It's actually just a combination of all the little ones. Yeah. And I love, I have a gratitude practice every morning, three things I'm thankful for. Sometimes I write it down. Sometimes I just think of it in my mind. Um, And you're right. And what it does is you start to look at the little things. And then when you have a day that's really bad, you're able to still identify the bright spots. And it's huge, huge. Yeah, I think, yeah, a couple of things that, that as you guys were thinking about, or you guys were talking about that, I was, I was thinking a little bit about, you know, you were talking about, Kristen, you were talking about being able to basically pour into yourself before you can, you know, pour or so that you can pour into others. And, you know, the one thing that, cause I've, I've come across this in, in my life. And sometimes that means you may not have your butt in the right seat on the bus. And, uh, you know, we're all in different seasons of life. And, you know, as, as I've got four kids and, and three of them are under the age of their, well, our eight year olds about to turn nine in a few weeks, but all right. Yeah. So, so, you know, we're spread out from 15 to, to five and, and, and they're kind of, you know, all over the place with the things that they're doing. And, uh, you know, I just realized I had to really cut back on a lot of, you know, how I structured things. And, you know, it's part of why student housing and insight exist. That's a story for another day, but, but yeah, it was done with, with a lot of intention of what's, what's most important. So don't be afraid if you're in that general manager seat or you're in that regional manager seat and you're flying all around the country, supporting your teams. If there's, if you're becoming, if you're, I can't remember who says it, but they talk about being out of season. And if you find yourself out of season, you're headed for some, for some real dangerous waters. And I would just, really, really encourage you to take some time out and think about, you know, what's, what's really best for, for you and how you can design, you know, your, your best life as, as well as you can. Mm -hmm. All right. One more question. What is the most important piece of advice you would provide to someone stepping into a leadership position for the first time? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um. Well, I think that listening is, is where it's all at because listening is about making people feel heard and seen. And when people feel heard and seen, that's when you build trust. That's when feedback becomes easier. That's when, you know, I think you can really become a team. I mean, here's the thing. Listening is about hearing. And if I could go back and do anything differently, I wish I talked a lot less and heard a lot more because if we are willing to be quiet and to let other people talk and to be the last one to speak in a meeting, the last one to share our idea, the last one, we will be amazed at what our people are capable of. And leadership is about empowering people. So if you're the one solving everything and speaking all the time, you're not giving anyone the chance to grow. So I'll just give you a practical tip. This is my best tip I've got with listening. In meetings with my team, I have a notebook and I challenge myself that whenever I have an idea or a question, instead of sharing it out loud, I just write it in my notebook. And at the end of the meeting, after everyone has shared, I go through my notebook and I cross off what has already been answered. Maybe someone shared an idea that I had had, you know, and I'm always amazed at the number of times I have nothing left in my notebook. And I say, I have nothing to add. This was a great meeting. So proud of you all. And then sometimes I still have a question or something and I'll ask it, but giving training yourself to be the last person to speak. Yeah. I know Simon Sinek is a, is a big mentor for you, but leaders eat last Yeah, is so key. Um, I would definitely recommend that book. Any other books you would recommend to first time leaders or somebody getting ready to jump into that role? I'm look, you see me looking cause I've got books everywhere. <laughs> books. You know, I would say The Gifts of Imperfection, Brene Brown is a wonderful one. Everybody Matters, written by Bob Chapman, is another wonderful one. Uh, One that is really specific to this time, 
when things fall apart. It is so good. It is. Yeah, who's that about? Pima Chod- Chodron. Am uh, I Cord- pronouncing that wrong? <laughs> Probably am. Um, heart advice for difficult times. I read this at the beginning of COVID and it was so huge for my mindset. And I just, I decided to read it again for the beginning of 2021. It's amazing. Great. Jennifer, any other questions? No, I'm, I, thank you so much for being with us today, Kristen. It was awesome. And I, I have to share that I love what you said about listening. That's one of the goals I've um, challenged myself with as a leader for 2021 is to talk less and listen more. One of my top strengths is communication. So the listening can be a basement to that. Um, So, you know, I took something away from this as well as I always do when I listen to you. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. And thank you to everyone for your questions. I mean, this is just amazing. And, you know, you've got this one step at a time one day at a time, one moment at a time. Leadership is hard. It's hard and this is a hard time, but just what's the one next thing you can do and just kind of focus yourself there. And then next thing you know, you look back and you'll see all that you've accomplished. Well, Kristen, thank you so much. And and Jennifer, again, big thanks to, to Cardinal for help sponsoring this as well. Um, again, Kristen Hadid, kristenhadid.com. Um, any, any, anywhere else they can follow you? What's your, what's your Twitter? What's your, all those Same good things. Hadid on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, and then my live, if you want to register for that, it's in the bio on my Instagram. So you can find that link there. Well, fantastic. Well, guys, thanks so much for, for tuning in. And I hope you take a lot away from this. Kristen, Jennifer, thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you. I always end with a Zoom hug. So I'm going to give everyone a hug. Thank you so much. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Well, again, a big thanks to to both to both Kristen and Jennifer for spending time with us in, in that interview. And uh, there's just so many nuggets in what she said. Um, and, and I wanted to spend some time with with our ambassadors that we've got here today to to really talk about their takeaways and perspectives and how they're you know probably going to in, implement some of these things with their teams. So let's uh, let's get started with that. First question I've got for you guys. And I'll just put it out there. Aaron, we'll start with you. What do you think about Kristen's entrepreneurial story or her journey? Yeah, I think it's just really relatable. I mean, especially just the whole turn and having people quit on you and really just kind of that persistence of not letting your failures, you know, define who you are and really giving yourself that permission and grace. Um, I just find it super relatable on, you know, both a professional and a personal front. Randy, how about you? Yeah, absolutely. I, I thought it was hilarious that she wanted to buy a pair of jeans, right? I, I think that's, you know, you want something and, and now she has to do something. Um, I feel like... Randy, I've got, I've got a feeling you've never spent $99 on a pair of jeans. <laughs> I think you're I mean, 100% right. I, I don't even yeah. know if I spent half of that on a pair of jeans. I don't think I have either. <laughs> okay. So we're on the, we're on the same on the same page there. Uh, however, I have failed numerous times and turn, turn will humble you and it will make you cry and it will make you wonder what you're doing in this industry. But through that, uh, we endure and, and we get better. Yeah. Maria, how about you? I couldn't agree more. I think that one of the things that I just really found humbling about her story is just, you know, her willingness to share that and to be open and um, to really be vulnerable with everyone about what that experience was like and how that really transformed her mindset in, you know, leading and growing her team, her company. And then of course, resulting in being able to tell that in that, in the story in the book. And she was super open and honest in, in the interview and in sharing all of those hurdles with us too. It was very, very insightful. So, you know, she talked a lot about, you know, getting buy-in from students and specifically Gen Z. I mean, you know, when she started this thing, you know, she's a millennial and she was, you know, she was dealing with a lot of her peers, basically. And and I think, I mean, let's face it, in our industry, especially at the at the site leadership level right now, it's mostly millennials. I would say it's probably 90% millennials and, and, you know, they're now working with, with Gen Z. And I think a lot of, I think a lot of millennial 
you know, site managers and regional managers are, are you know, that seen a little bit of difficulty, you know, when it comes to when it comes to relating and kind of preparing. Is there anything that she said that you're, you know, taking back to your teams and, and implementing with them? For me, it was really the why. I'm really big about explaining the bigger picture. Um, you know, being on site, I do deal with a lot of Gen Z college students. This is, you know, a very part time situation for them while they get through school. And I think a lot of the things that we actually deal with on a day to day basis relate to other things that they're probably going to go on and do in their full time careers once they graduate. So really explaining the why for me um, was something that stuck out and something I try and do on an everyday basis with my teams. Yeah. Randy, how about you? Yeah, this this really spoke to me because my my entire leasing staff is made up of 27 part time student agents. And, and my goal is to give them a platform in which they can be successful to springboard into something else. So we're, we're working for a bigger picture here. And I know that they're not going to be with my company in three, four, five years, but I, I want them to buy in and, and really investing in, in, in our, our teams and, and sharing our stories together so we can work to become something better is, is, is what this journey is all about. And when you have that cohesiveness, they, your staff will run through a brick wall for you because you will run through a brick wall for them. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. And it's, you know, out of, I follow everybody's Instagram pages as far as the company pages, the property pages. And I, I've really loved following Young America. I mean, you guys have, you know, you got, you guys are a little different as we talked, you know, you're, you're focused pretty much all in, in, in one market, but it, it's really cool. Cause you guys, you guys definitely tell a story about what you guys are doing. So, so yeah, that's interesting. And I would suggest anybody that's, wanting to to understand what that looks like because i think we all do a really good job of of doing instagram but you guys there's just a way that i connect with you guys versus everybody else and, and it's really come through in your social media so yeah Thank go you. check please go check those guys out maria how about you on uh things to implement with your teams for me i really enjoyed you know leading with humanity and i really enjoyed making the journey you know telling them about the why and then making it feel like you understand them personally, you're invested in them and kind of sharing that, that journey together. I think that this generation doesn't want a leadership team that, you know, this is why we do it. And it's just kind of a set in stone. Everything has to be a certain way, but that they're brought into the process that we are investing in them personally. And we're making that connection and, a lot of the things that the team that I manage, we, we have a lot of personal connections with, oh, you're not feeling well, investing in making sure they felt that connection between us and them. So, you know, sending them a little door dash or doing things that just make them understand that we're here with you and we're living life with you. I think with both Gen Z and millennials, you know, it's it's something that that they need that authenticity that that comes from it. And I really enjoyed hearing her talk through um, how you can bring that humanity to your team in the workplace. Yeah, that's that's definitely so important. I mean, at, yeah, at the end of the day, we're all humans. We've all got stuff going on. And I think investing a little bit more time into understanding everybody's story, I think, is mm -hmm. is really key to that. So, so hey, we, we talked about the moving goalpost of, of 2020. As you guys have been talking and working with your teams throughout you know, this dumpster fire of the past year, uh, what were, what were the th things that they voiced to, to you that, you know, worried them? And, and, and I'm kind of wondering, has it changed now that you're moving into 2021 at all? For my team, it was really just the uncertainty. I mean, with California, especially in COVID, it hit, it hit us very hard. Um, I'm only about 45 minutes east of LA. So it was very, very, you know, trying times last year of what does this look like? How, how are we even going to get through this? And even still in the early months in 2021, that's not something we have the exact answers to. But something that was said in the interview that I really liked is just control what you can control. And, you know, planning really is ultimately guessing to some degree. And at the end of the day, we have residents here. We have things, you know, that we have to get done. Let's let's focus on that and be present in the moment because we really don't know what's going to go on. And there's no real sense in worrying about that. So I think our main goal for 2021 is just to be present, um, continue to build the sense of community we already have in 2020, and just really continue to bring that, you know, compassion into the things we do every single day. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that, you know, the initial fear was jobs, right? People people were worried about what happens if a shutdown happens or, you know, 
Um, where's the income source going to come from? And, the, and, and as we got through that phase, then it became an operations nightmare, right? Like how do, how do we handle maintenance issues while we're walking into apartments? Do we have enough PPE? Do we have, uh, you know, operations standpoints for showing active units and not just having models? Some of our buildings don't have the luxury of having model units. So we're showing lived in units, you know, so the, the biggest takeaway that I had from that was no more annual goals because <laughs> we don't know what's happening in a year out from us. So we might have one or two big touch points that we're always working towards, but shifting that to a 12 week, a three month window. And then we have constant feedback on that. Are, are we doing what we need to do in this three month section? Uh, just really resonated with me. And, and, and uh, you know, pitching that last week to my managing broker was, was, was a big deal. Gotcha. Yeah. I think for, uh, for us and, and the way that we've kind of dumpster fired our past year, if you will, is we learned a lot of really great things. We learned a lot about processes, procedures, things that we've put into place that we can readjust that have a longevity, like move-in day you know, can be drive-through and it doesn't have to go back to the old days of stations and some of the previous uh, ways in which we did business. And that maybe by doing that, we also might be making the process simpler, easier to navigate for our end user. There were a lot of different best practices that came out of the uncertainty of the change that we needed to adapt to that will forever change the way that we not only manage, but service our customers. It required, I think, a, a level of honesty and authenticity with our customers that we maybe previously before weren't willing to be humble enough to exude through our experiences with them and, and to some extent brought that customer journey to a whole new level for what, what we can provide and level of service and just just the way that we you know treat each other. And I think that, that for student in particular, I thought it was a really great um, opportunity to take that journey. For marketing, we had to readjust everything we did to shift all of our efforts to online digital marketing efforts where we normally would have done things in person. And that came with a lot of anxiety, also uncertainty about will that yield uh, returns. And it also changed our messaging, the way that we just built our websites, the way that we you know, communicated online, changed some of our social strategies. And I think that it, it allowed for the words that are in her book and the things that you learn by listening to her session to really resonate with the reality of your day to day. Like you had yeah. to throw out the playbook. You had to say, we're, we're, we didn't meet our goals. We're not, we're not doing everything that we set out to do for the year, but it's okay. And it's okay to shift and it's okay to make those changes and be real about it. And so I think for us, you know, thinking ahead to this year and, and looking at what we learned from last year, um, sure, we'll make, we'll make some big picture ideas in our mind of what we want to do, but it really makes you think about the the longer term mindset, not the most infinite or, you know, easily to attain right now, but way down the road, where do we see ourselves and how can we attain that? But I do feel like a lot of really great things came out of it, despite the challenges and the hurdles and the trying moments where we all looked back and said, wow, we've changed this process forever. And that's yeah. a great thing. Yeah. No, I think that's so key. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that we've realized that we didn't need. Um, mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. not just, yeah. you know, personally, but, <laughs> but even, even with, um, <clears throat> you know, within our businesses, I feel like there's been a, a real focus on, okay, we, we were always concerned about taking this away. And now that we know that we don't need that, it's, it's like, okay, we can, we can shed this and, and, and focus on what's really important. And, and I mm -hmm. think it's, you know, it's going to be interesting to see you know, how this is going to, I'm really interested in seeing how this is going to affect the way that we continue to lease. Mm -hmm. You know, I've spent some time uh, both in Canada and in, in the UK working on student housing deals. And especially in the UK, it is, it's very different. It's very centrally leased and managed. Randy, probably much more like, you know, your business model is yeah, in, in Illinois. And, I, you know, I'm kind of wondering, you know, I've seen some other companies here that are, are taking a real, a real close look at, you know, how much could we actually do out of some type of central office? And in a lot of ways, that's scary for me, 
because I've always said this is a, you know, this is a people business and, and we've got to have the frontline people there. I, I don't think that could ever be taken away completely, but I think, I think one thing that I've learned is that, you know, through all this is that, you know, the, the students are comfortable with, with doing things out of a central office, uh, doing a lot more things from the website than whatever great ever gave them credit for. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a little concerned, you know, that there's some processes out there that the companies are going to have to work through and, you know, working with their property management systems and things like that to, to really evolve. But uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that, that comes out. Well, guys, that's a wrap for this episode. Thanks so much to, to Aaron, Randy, and Maria for their time and sharing your perspectives. You know, I think sharing perspectives is so key in this industry, and, and I appreciate it so much. Well, folks, don't forget, if you want to join us for our weekly online meetup, don't forget to go register at studenthousinginsight.com. Also, while you are there, make sure you join our online community. That's where we share everything from job posts to industry news and a lot of just funny stories about this crazy industry that we're in. You can join by clicking the login button up in the upper right-hand corner and go through the sign-up process. Again, thanks to you guys. Uh, I hope to see you soon, and I, I know I'll see you on Wednesday at Memo, right? Of course. Thank <laughs> you for having me. Yeah. All right, guys. Take care.